Welcome back to another episode of the Better Decisions podcast. I'm sitting here today with somebody that uh, I'm sure people watching this will recognize, Maya Vanda. Hi. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming in. So um, I'm going to just address the elephant in the room. You're obviously on the Selling Sunset show. I'm going to ask you some questions, but we're going to try and stay away from the stuff that you'd probably get if you're on TMZ or something else. More to do with real estate because... I like that. <laughs> you're a real, ser you're a legitimately serious real estate um, agent yeah. in the business. And I know that the impression that people have of the show is like everyone's just trying to wear pretty dresses, look cool, show off cars and kind of show a lifestyle, not actually doing the job, which is selling real estate. You, uh, we met in 2017. We did a deal in 2017. Right. It's a, it feels like a lifetime ago. And then the show started in 2019. How did that happen? Right? How did that transition occur? Yeah, so we filmed, so I used to live in LA. We filmed the pilot uh, for Selling Sunset. It was actually a demo, a small demo, like 10 minutes clip. Um, I was licensed in LA with the Oppenheim Group. And my husband got a job in Miami, so I didn't know what's going to happen with the show. And obviously, the job was amazing opportunity for him. We relocated. And a couple of months, and I got my license in Miami. I started selling real estate here, and the show got picked up. Yeah. So I'm like, what do I do now? Thankfully, they still wanted me in the show, and I was playing the back and forth with Miami, L.A., but then I start flying to film Selling Sunset, and I flew every week. That was for, mm. so from the get go, you were going back and forth every week. Every red eyes, seven a.m. flight. It's so funny that the, you're giving me this information because I literally got off the red eye last yesterday morning, and I flew in. I left at eleven. Those are brutal. The red eleven p.m. landing at six forty-five. Yep. Which obviously there's a three-hour time difference, so you get like four you, hours of it's sleep. It's terrible. I felt like I had just been... Partying in a club, right? I felt like I hadn't slept for a week. It was brutal. And by four o'clock, my <clears> brain had turned to mush. Um, doing that every week and running real estate business anyway and then going on camera, that's brutal. It's tough. That's why I was probably the least glamorous person <laughs> on the show, the least putting effort on the show because I didn't have the luxury of driving five minutes to the office and look all you know, amazing. Like as as I landed at like 11 a.m. in LA, rent my car, drove to the set, get, you know, dry bar, you know, blow dry quickly and very basic makeup and film the scene. If I had to stay for an extra scene, extra day, I stayed. Obviously, I had a place in LA. Yeah. But then I wanted to be with my husband before my kids. I took a red eye so I can have the whole day, um, you know, for myself. And plus, I start working here, so I can't just disappear on clients. As you know, it's full-time job. Yeah, how does that work? How do you actually sell real estate during that period? I mean, obviously, that was a, a tough time for you. And it was just me. I was a solo agent. It was tough, and I started doing well. But, you know, well, closing a couple of deals here, nothing crazy, because I had to start from scratch. Yeah. I knew z zero person, like, in Miami. And I'm like, what do I do? So I did online marketing. I do online leads. And that's how I, get, I got started here. But it was tough, because... Half of the week, you film the show in LA, so I'm back and forth. It's hard to focus in a any market, frankly. Yeah. Uh, it was very challenging, and then season two and three got picked up, and we filmed it back to back. So instead of filming eight episodes for on a course of like four months, all of a sudden we are filming six months. And then I was pregnant. I had my baby. Then I traveled with my baby. I mean, it's, I got it done, but looking back, I'm like, how the hell yeah, did it, I get it, this done? That's kind of insane because, look, you watch uh -huh. the show and there's this, like, they always, like, projected commissions. And obviously I the wish. whole... Well, that's the irony of it is because there's no way you can run those kind of volumes doing a show and flying and traveling. And even the other ladies who did the show as well, you know, when you look at the big agents who are working 24-7 uh -huh. without a camera in their face, it's impossible to compete at that level, that's got to be hard. Plus, your clients don't want you or the real estate that you're selling. They don't want their exposure in a show. And that was the challenging part, especially with season one and two. We didn't, people didn't know Selling Sunset. So my clients, for instance, in LA, that I closed deals prior to even leaving and trying to put them on the show, they didn't want to show their houses and money and wealth, and they didn't want to be exposed. So yeah. for me, it was challenging to get my clients to the show some people love being on camera, like, you know, Jason and Mary had a couple of celebrity clients. They're used to the camera. They are Hollywood, so no problem. They don't care. Uh, so, you know, it was maybe easier for some, some of us in, in, in uh, Selling Sunset to bring those clients to the show. But a lot of the problems we had, it's like 
the clients don't want to be exposed. So who's really selling the real estate? It's so guys, must be guys in the background. Th the guys are selling the real estate. The girls too, I mean, I give them that, but sometimes, you know, you film for six months, you are going to close deals organically as, you know, we film, but sometimes the deal closed like a month before we start filming and we want to show the house because it's a beautiful house. So we have to bring the client again and kind of like, reconfigure the deal and, you know, to, to make it to the show. And it's not necessarily happening right there and then. Yeah. So we make it work, you know, because we want to show real estate. The producer wanted to show real estate. At least in season one, they wanted to show real estate. Little by little after every season, just <laughs> yeah, got more drama than real estate. But it, it is hard to, to get everybody live in the same time as you're closing deals. As, as you know, in our business, yeah. some buyers take one year to, to buy something. Some sellers, you know, we, we lose listings. Like, it's, it's not as perfect as we see, I wish, but... No, I think the reality <laughs> is, is, is very, very different. And in terms of, like, how much you're selling, when you look at the Forbes list of, of the top realtors or the real... Is it the real deal? I think it's one of the, the people who put out the, uh, the list every year. You know, when you've got agents, the top agents are selling three, four, five hundred, a billion dollars, two billion dollars a year of real estate... It's impossible. It's my goal, I know. It's, it's my goal. It's impossible to do. I can tell you, look, we did 400 last year or whatever, and and we're a team. That's really, really hard to do. It is. I mean, that is a slog. There's no way you could do it with a with a camera in your face. So the girls on TV, I understand their MO isn't actually a brand to sell real estate. They're building their brand in other capacities for other reasons. And some girls in the show, some of them are more in the real estate business serious, but some of them are more in, you know, the industry, the Hollywood and acting and getting, you know, modeling gig or whatever they do. And that's okay. The show got, gave them that exposure. For me personally, I was doing five years real estate in LA before we start filming the show. So I saw it, I saw it as an amazing opportunity to give myself free marketing. Uh, I didn't know how the show direction will be. I was mm -hmm. hoping more for like a million dollar listing female version, which we started this way. It just became a little bit more drama. People love the drama and it did really well. But also... You know, like I noticed in my personal like scenes, I got cut because it wasn't anything you, juicy. You, you weren't you weren't crazy enough. You I had wasn't crazy. The crazy, like I didn't have the crazy story. You know, like my first season, I was pregnant and people were happy, and that was my storyline. But then every season, I was pregnant, so it wasn't even interesting <laughs> at this point. <laughs> like, oh, it's again. She's pregnant okay. again, um, and and that's it. And you know, I I had I had fun. I mean, it's great. It's a good exposure. We got paid, so I can't complain. It opens a lot of doors also for Instagram and endorsements, and I have to do endorsements too because I have a great audience. Yeah, you've got a, you've got a fantastic Instagram following. You, you've got critical mass, as yeah. we call it. I'm a marketing guy, so I spend my time looking at all this kind of nerdy yeah. stuff. But yeah, you've got critical mass. So you've got an audience. Now it's about the message. So now, now <clears throat> stepping away from that whole world, now you're in the real, the real world of real estate full time. This is like... And I was always doing it full-time, but yes, it's how to do it full-time when you're in two different markets. I and mean, you're I in Miami now. You're, this is your full -time like, in this Miami. Is your full base. Yeah, I live here. And last year when I, I was d decided to be done with the show because I knew like, you know, COVID was over. My husband is going back to the office, you know, not working remotely and he can take care of the kids. It's time to, to part way with the show. And especially because my real estate scenes got cut and, you know, it's a bit risky when you're on a reality show you say one line, you say something, and then all of a sudden people can hate you and you get a lot of, you can get hate on social media. And I do not need that energy in my life, especially as a mom. I have my kids. It's important yeah, for me Yeah, you got to protect your family. And that's the thing that, you know, it's, it's a real human being. And, and, yeah. and, you know, there's some nasty trolling out there. And, and now, obviously, you're in the business and you're, you're now, obviously, you're w with Compass and you're here in Miami full time. Yeah, and we're upstairs, actually. You're I'm literally, like, <laughs> yeah. It, we're on the first floor. You're on the third floor. Uh, fourth. Fourth floor. Okay, yeah. so like literally. You're, yeah. You're, um, so with that now in mind and you're ad adapting, one of the interesting things is that you do still have that knowledge of the LA market. And I've just come back. I've got partners in LA. And obviously it struck me that a few years ago when we would used to watch any TV show or were aware of any real estate transactions that was happening in LA, they were poles apart from the Miami market. We used to look at the stuff and go, like that's crazy. Price that's price 20, price. you know, that's a $20 million house. And, you know, it's, it's 6,000, 7,000 square feet. That's so expensive or 10,000 square yeah. feet. Now, now in Miami, I look at it and go, like I was in a house two days ago. It was like John Legend's old house um, and owned by Rihanna. And we actually walked around the house and we were shooting it. And it's on the market for 17.3 or 17.4. 
and it's 8,500 square feet on an acre overlooking the, the canyon in Beverly Hills on one side. And Hopefully then the they won't get a fire over there. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is actually part of the conversation I'm going to talk to you about. We the have whole hurricane insurance. insurance, they have fire, and they, a lot of the houses cannot get insured. Y y yeah, I exactly. And, and, and there's a whole section I want to kind of touch yeah. on that with you. I was surprised uh -huh. that, you know, it was around, what, $2,000 a square foot. And I looked at it, and it was a custom home. And I said, it's kind of cheap. Because now when I, you know, we sell around here, we sell in like Gables Estates and Old Cutler Bay and Snapper Creek and the Venetian Islands and Sunset. And, you know, that we have trades. I'm negotiating one right now, like 35, 3,600 a square foot. You know, I remember when we right. first moved to Miami, I feel like, yeah, almost six years ago, I used to go to Brokers Open and those, all these houses on the, you know, Venetian Islands, uh, North Bay Road, which was always more a bit like luxury. Yeah. But they, they used to sit for a year, two years on the market. And, you know, they priced them like 12, 13 million and they used to sit, nobody touched them. And then COVID happened and then people just like buy them like crazy and flip them two months later. And it's nice to see that Miami is, when, I, when we moved here, I always felt like it was underrated. And it's nice to see that people appreciate what Miami has to offer. I'm excited about it. I, lo I love your comments, by the way, because this is great. I mean, look, I'm very biased. I live here. I've lived here since I moved here 16 years ago um. from the UK. But you know both cities. So tell me from the point of view, like, why do you think, I mean, I know there's like the taxes and all these other yeah. variables coming in, but the lifestyle. How has the lifestyle differed for you coming from LA even to Miami? Estate, How do you feel it? Even real estate. Like, you know, people complain about traffic in Miami, but when I go do showings, I don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to drive an hour to do showing. The worst case, yeah, I drive to Sunny Isle or Bal Harbor, which I don't do it as often. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. And then, you know, you drive to Miami Beach to do a showing, like you drive on the causeway. It's beautiful. You see the cruise ship. Like it's, it, there is a good energy. And that's how I felt when I first moved here. And I like that. I mean, I think LA is a great city, but it's not a pretty city. You have nice pockets. You have Santa Monica. I didn't Monica. want to say it, but it's, yeah, there's some pretty scratchy You know, if you areas. go from LAX to Sunset, it's kind of like everything looks like, you know, like in, industrial almost. Yeah. So, you know, in the TV, LA looks amazing because they have the hills and the houses and there is a, this, these awesome views, They never show the drive up to the houses. Oh this is God, the irony. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. You drive up to the houses and there's you like... You pray that nobody comes in front of you. There's plastic sheeting on the side of the street. There's some like boxes and there's a lot of houses that look like they need to be torn down. It looks like they're um, one earthquake. But, yeah. I, and you know, like the, the area that... Like, that's why I like Mount Olympus in LA because the roads are wide, the power line are underneath the, the road. So it's a nice pocket, very cl close to Sunset Plaza, underrated in LA. But I think Miami, when I moved here and, you know, we lived in Brick Hill, I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I don't have to drive. Like, I, you know, I started most of my business in Brick Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and I th it just, and then we moved to the Gables and we bought the house for like 400 per square foot. And I thought we overpaid by like a little oh, bit. 400 a square foot. I know. Okay, if you're watching this and you want to say 400 a square foot for a nice home, good luck. You're not going to find it. No, no, no way. No, now we're at... Not even we're, a teardown. We're averaging <coughs> right now in the Gables, I want to say it's about 850, 900, yeah. and then obviously the newer homes are hitting 1100, yeah. 1200 a square foot. Dry lot, not water. Water's a whole other ballgame. Yeah. Water's like Gables Estates. You don't even get into Gables Estates for less than 25 million right now. I exactly. Which I was telling people in Pacific Palisades, and they were like, really? And then I'm like, have you been? Have you seen that neighborhood? It's beautiful. It's And you have gorgeous. the boat, and... So I think Miami has a lot of like nice lifestyle to offer. And it just looking at like the pockets that we have, okay, we have Miami Beach. People always think about Miami, Miami Beach. Yeah. But you have Coconut Grove, you have Design District. Wynwood is kind of like artsy and fun, but you just, I mean, the Gables have great restaurants. Like you have so many cute pockets and nightlife and lifestyle that I think like the last five years become better and better. And it's nice to see that people finally appreciate it and they don't think about Miami as the cheesy. Yeah, you can be cheesy in Miami yeah. if you Doesn't want Doesn't it to. drive you crazy when people talk to you about like, oh, South Beach. Uh. I'm like, that is not Miami. That's no. where all the... Nobody in South Beach is from Miami. They're, they're on vacation. The real Miami, once you come into the Gave and the of Grove, like, Grove and Gables and yeah. you go into the gated communities and all those areas, they you suddenly realize there's a consistency. I think this is the one thing and I realized. Like there's real community. community, real consistency. Transitioning through the Grove or the Gables, there's really very little in the way of like a bad area to go through. Yeah. And you can go out from like Gables Estates and then you're into Ponce Davis and then you're into the Gables. And it's, a, it's just nice continuously. 
Yeah, and yeah. I wish, honestly, I wish instead of buying, I mean, I live literally down the street, but I wish instead of buying it, I would buy Pons Davis like three years ago because I'll tell you what, I love, half. I love, Pons Davis is, is one of those neighborhoods that people don't even know when they're moving into Miami because it's not that well advertised. I mean, yeah. I, I do, I write articles on Pons Davis. I mean, Davis. lives there. <laughs> yeah, he actually lives like one, because I, I live on 76th, he yeah. lived like, his house was one street across. Else. I think it was on like Pine Drive or or on the back of schoolhouse. Uh -huh. But yes, I mean, again, the houses around there are beautiful. It's very green. It's very tropical. Everyone thinks of the beach. Now, obviously, with the LA markets, one of the things I found out, and you touched on this a few minutes ago, was about insurance and, and about, yeah. about climate change. And the first thing people told me when I went out there was, so what are your thoughts about climate change? And it was, a, it was an interesting dialogue because... They were very, I think people in LA are very aware, especially in certain areas, about the insurance premiums caused by the fires. Yeah, a lot of people which lost is a their big homes. problem every year. You know, we shoot a beautiful house, probably one of my favorite houses we shot in season, I think it was season four in Selling Sunset. Beautiful, like up in Bel Air, Bel Air. But if you look around, everything was like burned. Like basically, the houses around got burned. So the developer built a beautiful house there, but they it took them a while to sell because you had to only sell it for, to cash buyers. Lender will not lend. You cannot insure the house. It was uninsurable? Uninsurable. Can wow. insure. So half, it was a $9 million house. Beautiful views. Like amazing. Like one of my favorite actually. And she told me, yeah, we can't. It's hard to sell because they ended up selling to a cash buyer thing from the Bay Area. They didn't care. Probably used to fires and it's like, probably like, what are the chances? But it's a big risk. It's mm -hmm. a big risk to pay a $10 million house or $9 million cash. And you can insure it if, God forbid, something happened. And those fires are happening more often. And if you can get insurance, what are, the pre what are they paying on the premiums? What do you typically pay for, let's say, a $10 million home? Exactly. I don't know. That I don't know with insurance. I heard. I mean, some, some people are throwing numbers at me and saying, you know, it's like 60 grand, 70 grand a year. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and, it's, and obviously then when we look at insurance here, I did an entire podcast on the whole insurance gig. And it uh, went up here too. So citizens, you, you go back and you watch the, the video I did. I, the guy who actually fights the insurance companies, he fights citizen and other people because the, the way they don't want to pay out. And the situation right now is that because of the, the risk, whether it's real or perceived, and I'm not an environmentalist, I'm not yeah. going to get into that whole like, this is what's happening because I don't study it. I'm not yeah. a geologist or anything or an environmentalist. But the conversation was very real, which was the insurance premiums are going up. And there are particular properties that are more at risk of insurance than others. So older homes that are on the water in Miami, right. for example, the flood insurance is potentially going to triple. So buying a home which is raised up, elevated, and, you know, Brickell, for example, you knew you've been in Brickell since 2017. During Irma, we had, you know, pictures of guys in like canoes going down yeah. Brickell <laughs> Avenue. And everyone would call me and be like, are you okay? Are you in a submarine? And I'm like, no, I'm in Coral Gables. And I'm, I was living close to Riviera Country Club at the time. Yeah. And it was like nothing, zero. Like there wasn't, like, there wasn't even a puddle at the end, end of the street. And I'm like, it's fine. Everything's fine. It's yeah, okay. I know. And the news is always... And you know, the news also, like I lived on, on, on Miami Avenue and Miami didn't even get flooded. So Brickell got flooded a little bit by the CVS there, but we didn't... Like I mean, 400 meters down the street. But exactly, but it was... Exactly. So... I mean, look, the hurricanes and whatever, the climate that we have here, obviously, we are always on a risk. But I think there is no perfect place. At least with storm, we can evacuate and leave. Once you have a fire or an earthquake, that's a whole different story. That's tough. Yeah, we don't have those. Well, there's yeah, no fires, thankfully. there's no earthquakes. And, and obviously, the homes uh, in certain areas. We don't have coyotes, but we have uh, crocodiles or whatever, like uh, Yeah, but no, I haven't seen a crocodile. I, I, I don't see crocodiles coming into Ponce Davis. I haven't, <laughs> seen, I haven't seen one neither, but that's the... That's what people think about Florida, right? Yeah, I don't think they'd make it across US-1, to be I honest know. with you. I mean, there's like, uh, unless they've, they're have they wearing a helmet or, or they're on a, on some form I, I, of I know. You know, scooter or maybe one of those mopeds. Um, but when we get into like the whole movement, the transition across, people ask me about, you know, obviously the flooding. I say, look, just stay in more <laughs> elevated areas and or have a home that's more, you know, built up, don't have a really old home. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but the movement, the migration, and you must have seen this firsthand as well, the migration coming over, what were people saying to you coming from LA that were moving to Miami? A lot of them, the taxes, and, the, and the, they say that California is just not friendly for businesses. Like I have fr clients who moved to Sunny Isle from LA. They lived in LA literally their whole life. And, uh, well, not their whole, they moved from Israel, but then they lived like 
majority of their life there. And they just say the business is just, the taxes are not friendly to, to their business and they had to relocate. Yeah. Um, how so it, how unfriendly I heard, like I was with friends mm-hmm. at the weekend and they said, if you add up the taxes that you get in a year, it's like 55%. Stadium of your income, income. It's, it's like it's n- i mean we see it with lot. you know like look we you and i are dub it whatever whatever we're 1099 double w9 i know no, it's no, w, no we're not 1099 we're self-employed yeah yeah 1099 yeah, 10 yeah. no, w2 so my husband is a w2 is a salary and yeah if we would stay in california we would pay extra whatever 50 100k or just on state income it's a yeah lot it's, of money. it's 13 percent or 11 it, to 30 it's, something it's like that lot. now and this is something that somebody from San Francisco said to me. They call it death by a thousand cuts. Now you have a whole new introduction, which is the mansion tax. The ULA, they yeah. call it, the, the, there's a particular term for it. Um, that is 4% for anything over 5 million, 5.5% for anything over 10 million. And obviously the developers, and I was learning this, and actually funnily enough, it was I think it was Jason, Jason Oppenheim within the Oppenheim group, who said... He sent a bunch of emails about it. He called it a death blow for the developers. And so I was speaking to a commercial guy out there, and he said, here's the situation. You've got developers who have money coming in from outside investors, from investor groups, and obviously your husband's in this this gig. So you get... You, you know how these guys come together and say, okay, I'm going to put money into a fund to, it, to invest in a big development project. Right. And they're expecting a, a, diff, a certain return, a return on their investment that might be promised at like 11%. And then obviously there's there's a, a goals and there's um, bonuses that are being promised to the developer for delivering. But right now, that 5.5%, you know, you think about it on a billion dollar construction. Right. That's $55 million. That's 5, 5.5% is just wiped off. So there's no bonuses. There's no extras. And they've got to get this out. And a few have called me directly and said, you know what, David? I'm going to develop somewhere else. And as someone said, I, you know, I tried Austin, but I realized it was in Texas, so that didn't work. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people moved to Texas while they moved to Miami, and I know a lot of people moved from Texas to They to tried Miami. it. I still find psychologically <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big ask in terms of, like, their, their um, you know, psychological, uh, political, social makeup. They'd like, you know, it didn't, didn't run well for me. And then they come to Miami and they're like, oh, actually this kind of fits nicely. Um, with that huge movement that seems to have already happened, do you see this being creating another big wave? Do you see this happening? Yes, because, because you know, like someone, even like the individual who sell a $5 million house, let's say he bought, let's say he bought the house for six and a half, seven, and he sell it in a, you know, bad time. I, I, I believe that law doesn't apply for a loss. Maybe you can offset it with his taxes, but you still have that tax that you have to pay no matter what, I think. I heard it's no matter what. I didn't, it's, yeah, it's I, not I, based off your, it's not like capital gains. Exactly. I mean, you've got capital so gains. So if you lost, you have to pay the taxes. So, you know, for a seller, you have obviously closing costs and then you have extra, you know, a couple of like thousands, that, you know, like 100K or whatever, $50,000 to, to pay extra taxes. It's a lot of money. I mean, I know like people that sell, yeah, five, $6 million house. Sure, they have money, but still it is a lot of money. And yeah. same with the $10 million house. Money is money no matter what. I understand what the city is trying to do. There is a huge problem with homeless people in LA. Like yeah. literally every time, every day you drive, you tents and tents. I hope that money will go in the right direction, but who knows? Well, you know, there's a billion dollars sitting in a fund right now that they'd actually taken and collected. They haven't even utilized it yet. So it's sitting there already. There's money right there and they haven't used it to actually address the issue. Now, again, I'm not going to get into the political argument or conversation. Are they actually going to use those taxes for the right thing? I don't know. They need to do, I guess they need to do something. And then again, if you look at this over a long period of time, one of the biggest changes I thought was going to be movement because of taxes, but social pressures, the environment, the homelessness issue, the cleanliness issue, that all these other like what I would call lifestyle. And also lifestyle. safety, it becomes it about, it's become a safety. Yeah. Like you pay so much money per square foot as we talked about. And then you make a left turn and you're like, are you going to get robbed and someone will take my watch or my jewelry? I mean, wh- wh- what happened? Th- was that something that you felt in LA? I didn't really feel it as bad. Um, I, you know, like I lived in Marina, in the Marina del Rey area yeah, when I filmed I this the show and I love the area. But I t- can tell you, like a few years ago, I felt a little bit more comfortable walking around Venice. I didn't do it this time. And I know that after I'm done, I was done with filming, a couple of times, like behind the office, in Sunset Plaza, midday, people got robbed in the parking lot for like watches. Really? Because yeah. Because I used to get emails from Jason, hey guys, a robbery just happened. I'm like, what is this? Middle of the day. I think they don't uh, do anything to those people and put them in, the, in, in whatever, in the right place, in jail or whatever. And people do whatever they want. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a soft approach to, <clears throat> to crime 
And obviously somebody asked me, like, you know, uh, I had actually a situation where someone was telling me, you know, they were concerned about a break-in. And like, what do you do? Well, what do the, the police arrest them? Some people hire private... Uh, private security. security. So you've now moved in Miami. You, how, how safe do you feel in Miami? 100% safe. I mean, I know, like, actually two, three months ago, we did have a shooting accident in the Gables, by the way. I don't know if you heard about it. It was, like, in a building uh, in one of next to Miracle Mile. But that was really, like... You know. There was one that happened years ago, I remember, in, in Merrick Park that occurred. Oh, I was that was the guy in yeah, Equinox. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I remember that. But the irony is is that, you know, with the break-ins, uh -huh. um, you don't get them because obviously we have castle law. So uh, people say, what do you do when someone breaks into your house? And I'm like, you can shoot them. It's, that's, that's castle law. And people are like, really? And I'm like, that's why you don't get break-ins. I mean, you, I'm not saying you don't ever get them, but in terms of the level that you get it, it's greatly diminished. We don't have a big homeless issue. You don't feel it. It's actually a very You don't clean feel it as bad, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know there are more in downtown, but you don't feel it's, it's, it's not it's as small bad as pockets, LA. Very, yeah. very, very small pockets. And it's a very clean city. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful city, to be honest with you. You drive around, you look, as you said, you were saying to me earlier, you drive across the causeway and you're like, this is, yeah, this beautiful. is beautiful. It's a nice day. Um, and I obviously know, you know, the, 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 down, the upsides definitely outweigh the downsides. Um, now you are here and you, this is kind of an interesting thing because you know the geography of both cities. The which one? The geography. You know, the, the, the neighborhoods yes, yes, yes. in LA and, the, and mm -hmm. the ones in Miami. And so one of the things that we try to create when we're selling real estate is understanding your clients and what they need, understanding right. their lifestyle, understanding, you know, decision making is not just, I'm very numbers, so I give people a lot of data, but decision we also understand is not just about, you know, the numbers, it's also about yeah. giving your family the lifestyle that you want. And majority of people moving in are families. And obviously there's businesses, there's lots of hedge funds moving right. in. But with the neighborhoods, I'm going to give you uh, a neighborhood in L.A. rather than the other way around, because I know it a little bit. And you're going to give me the equivalent neighborhood in okay. Miami and why. Okay, perfect. Okay? So, Marina Del Rey. Wow. Okay, Marina, and I love Marina Del Rey. Um, I can't say necessarily Miami. Uh, you know what? Maybe, maybe Sunset Harbor. Sunset Harbor? Maybe Sunset Harbor. <coughs> yeah, that's actually not a bad comparison. Because I, I used to think of Coconut Grove originally, but then Coconut Grove is a bit like Venice, probably. Yeah, but Coconut Grove. Gosh, okay, I'm trying to think about areas in LA. Okay, so I would say Sunset Harbor just because you can walk a little bit. There are a little bit like coffee shops and restaurants. It's a bit isolated. It's not. So Marina Del Rey uh, is Sunset. Okay. I would a, say that, yeah. Although I do see similarity with the Grove in that sense, because you have the marina. Yeah. So that's a good, but also that's an hour of the marina. But. So, um, Coral Gables. Brentwood. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Because Brentwood's got the families and the, the schools. The families and the schools. And, and it's kind of big. And it's still close to, you know, other areas. Like, you know, Brentwood close to, like, let's say, it's kind of like in between Santa Monica and West Hollywood and Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Coral Gables, um, you know, you have the Grove, you have Brick Hill. So if you live in Brentwood right now and you're moving to Miami, Coral Gables is for you. Definitely. Uh -huh. But a lot of people love the Grove so too. Thought. Well, they're kind of interchangeable. And the Grove, you know, like it's hard because we mentioned LA, like let's say if I compare the Grove to a pocket in LA, it's hard for me to actually compare a pocket uh, in LA because the Grove has this unique wild trees and it looks very like it's a tropical, tropical yeah. very tropical it's, you don't have that you have a few palm trees oh, sprinkled a fake on the side one of the too, road that they probably import from florida you know <laughs> it's like, LA looks it's like very plastic dry. christmas trees compared to like a real forest uh, um, basically yeah uh but uh. uh then going up from there we were talking about ponce davis where i live in uh, at ponce davis so Ponce Davies, I would say, look, a lot of the mansions and stuff in Beverly Hills, like the flats or even Santa Monica flats, like they, they have like serious like properties. They're good land. Uh, Brent would have some pockets that, you know, Brent would uh, park like that area. They, they have like big lands and more like, you know, huge houses. So I would say it's a good mix between uh, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, but Santa Monica there, there is a pocket like is Georgina Street and very close to the ocean, but it's a very like nice pocket. I love that pocket. So I would say that. Okay. Although we have the water in See, I'm, I'm going from wide and I'm going to start to get really specific and it's going to get, these questions are going to get much tougher. Um, uh, Pinecrest. 
I always, for some reason, compare Pinecrest to, to Calabasas, for whatever reason. I, I don't know why. Be- maybe because the size of the homes. I was going to say, it's big homes, big it's lots. It's the big houses, yeah. And maybe, I guess, hidden hills. But, you know, again, Pinecrest is so beautiful and, and, and green, and LA is more deserty, but I feel like... The sizes of the, the homes. The size of the homes and the lots. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. So you go to the valley to get that in LA. Yeah. yeah. I, I was, I, that was kind of like the direction I was imagining you were going to go, but you yeah. kind of got a bit more specific, which is great. Um, um, going into like the top of the food chain when it comes to Miami, the most expensive neighborhoods, and I was going to think of like, do I say Indian Creek or do I say Gables Estates? Uh, I'm going to say Gables Estates because Gables Estates for me is like, to me, it's th- that's the top of the mountain. I also like Gables Estate more than Indian Creek. I think oh, because around Indian Creek, it's yeah, kind of like this. It not, it's not very it's nice not around. It's not pretty. It, but around Gables, everything's gorgeous. I know. So that's why I'm like, I don't know. Indian Creek, I feel like is a little bit overrated. So Gables, but all you need is a like big buyer like Tom Brady, and then everybody wants to buy around you. Yeah, or which is funny. So Gables Estates is obviously Miami old money, and and for those who might be watching this and tuning in from say LA or the other parts of the country, um, LA is you know uh, sorry Gables Estates is some of the most expensive real estate you'll find in Miami, big houses on the water. On the water, like where you get that. Beautiful $25 million entry price point into into that market, all the way up to like 100. What would be LA's equivalent? So I would tell you, um, Beverly Park. Beverly Park. Beverly okay. Park. It's a gated community in, in, in LA, in Beverly Hills, like up the hills. Yeah. And it's very hard to find in LA, actually, gated community unless you go to the valley. Mm-hmm. And Bre- uh, Beverly Park is is one of them. And, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, I think, had a house there. Like, you're talking about, like, big names. They own a couple of properties there. So I would say that... that I mean, look, Beverly Park area. will have the views of whatever, the canyons and all yeah. that. Here we have the view for the water, but it's the same... It's the same idea. Okay, so getting hypergranular, I'm going to give you the last one now. Uh, North Bay Road, which is a road, not even a neighborhood or a community. We're drilling down into, hi- again, real estate's hyper, hyper focused. North Bay Road. I would also say Brentwood because some houses on Brentwood are like kind of like on Sunset. Or maybe... What would be the street in LA? Like people say, like, sunset. give me the best street that oh, you would think Oh, the of. best street in LA? I mean, I wouldn't want to be on Sunset. It's too busy. No, no, no. I don't um, think Sunset would be North Bay Road. I'm thinking of this, you know, something that's... So, so this, the best street. Uh, look, there are great pockets in Beverly Hills. Um, gosh, why am I forgetting the name of the street right now? So clearly, I'm totally like blinking right yeah. now. Like I forget the name of it's the okay. street. We'll, we'll, e- we'll edit this bit. We'll edit this no, bit. No, no, no. It's like, it's like, because <laughs> like you have Wilshire and you have all these like... Yeah. Uh, LM and Palm and all these like streets in Beverly Hills. That well, I remember being on Laurel Way and kind of like those Laurel those Way. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, no, it's that a nice, it's a nice street if you go up, but it's not. It's I wouldn't say it's like that the there is going to uh-huh. be a street where it's like that is the street. Somebody says to you, "I live a house on here." You're going to be like, "Oh, I know that's going to be super expensive." I you know I want to say well even in Bel Air actually. Yeah, Bel Air has some like some. But what's the street in Bel Air? I mean, you have Bel Air, Bel Air Road. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think about like a good street name that, that because uh, Sunset is not. It's not Sunset. Yeah, Sunset's. Uh, I, I, was I mean, you see the nice houses there. I mean, it's obviously very close to Homeby Hills, which is, by the way, Homeby Hills. I would say it's also. Yeah, Homeby Hills. I've heard is is it's a great is pocket. really lovely. It's a um, very good pocket. And I personally like. For me, if someone says to me. Like the golden, check. somebody calls me up and says, oh, "I have a house on Arvada Parkway to sell." I'm like, oh, "Thank you, real estate gods," because that's like the street for me. Look at Dendra Arvada and Gables Estates. It's like that's doesn't so get any LA, doesn't actually, get any better. So one, you know? now, now I'm again about the lay. I don't know if we have the street. I think we have the pockets. Like, I, I think, okay, if I live in Beverly Hills, everybody knows. Like, I don't know if there is a specific street that people will like associate with. Yeah, it's I the don't little, know. it's little, little corner pockets that. Come out and that's yeah, what because that's okay. Of. You have Sunset, but then you have like all these like side streets. It's a go of Sunset that they have like amazing houses, or you go to up Moholland, and then you have those side streets. So it's like you have those main streets, but maybe you say like I live off Moholland, people will know, or I live off Wilshire or whatever. I don't know if there is a specific street that I will tell you that's the one. Um, 
Yeah, I, yeah, it's hard for me to pinpoint the street, yeah. but the uh, pockets. Yeah. Lot of areas. And finally, mm. I mean, the, the thing that I, I realized with the LA market, and, and somebody asked me about, you know, $10 million homes plus. You know, in Miami, it used to be like we'd sell maybe 10 or 20 a year or 20 to 30. I remember it was, it was that around that a few years ago. And then last year, we had 90 transactions over $10 million in one month, in the month of January. That's insane. In I did month, not know that in number. A month, in one wow. single month. And it just blew everyone out the water. And then we saw this cascade. And I used to, you know, you do a $10 million deal and you'd be like, wow, that's a really good number. That puts me on like the scoreboard. Now everyone's like, eh. It's like I know, shelling I know. peas. It's like one every day. Not that we do one every day, but, you know, it's it's so commonplace. I wish I did one every day. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> I it, I me, me too. It, point, it, would make it would make life a lot easier. Um, but I think we're going to see more of that great wealth migration happen and continue. Miami is actually ranked number two, according to Knight Frank's report, as the the um, the best luxury cities to live on the planet for 2023. I think growth-wise, still predicting growth for 2023, when every other city in the US is, is projecting shrinkage. Now, I know that's not the whole city, it's pockets, and it's the pockets that we're talking about Obviously. and that we're dealing with. Um, the phenomenon I think it's to leave with people who are coming in from LA is that Miami is not on sale. It's not a discount, you know, 30% off and we see buyers come it's in. It's not. And, and even now people are like, oh, I want a good deal. I want a good deal. Because yeah. I, I, I get it. The rates <laughs> are high. hand up on that guy really I fast. I know. The rates are high and people are a bit on hold and recession talk. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you compare Miami, I mean, heck, I was in New York two months ago. I'm like, oh, I love New York. Let me just look to maybe if, to buy a condo for an investment. And I go into Street Easy. I'm like, this is depressing. Like, you're still paying $600,000 on a, sorry to say, shitty studio in New York. I mean, you get here, like, a nice, like, at least one bedroom in Brick Hill with yeah. a view. So I feel like Miami, even though the price per square foot went, obviously, much higher and we compete with LA and, you know. Yeah, our, our top end <coughs> uh, competes very much with New York. I mean, like we were discussing before. It's just nicer. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, yeah, I mean, you've got you've got beautiful ocean views. You've got very clean beaches. You've got access to great shops and great restaurants. Yeah, some of the best restaurants, restaurants in the world. Um, and you, you obviously you've got you know the Four Seasons was at six thousand a square foot. You got Paragon did a penthouse at you know <coughs> 75, yeah. 70, 7,500 a square foot for Paragon. Um, and these kind of numbers are becoming obviously more commonplace. You can't get, like you said to, to me, that I've got a client who's who's got a budget of 2,000 a square foot. And you're like, eh, it's just, n you're not going to get Oceana no. or Fendi or any of the good buildings. You can't. And I try to explain to the clients. And, and you know, like also all day, let's say if I'm, I'm, you know, I took my client to Sunny Isle and they, or they're waiting for the price to come down. But the thing is with Sunny Isle or, you know, other of those like luxury condo, the owner of those condos, it's not their first home. They have a couple of properties. They're not necessarily desperate to sell. You know, they sit on a lot of money. So I don't know if prices will just completely crash. I mean, unless we're heading to a, a terrible, terrible recession that people really need to, you know, have some liquidity. But I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, I, I, <coughs> I actually I studied this in detail when I studied the condo market. And back in 2015, we had a pretty hefty correction because there was a lot of product that suddenly got injected into the system. And that happened through Brickle and Sunny Isles right. with a lot of new buildings. But that was real mid-range product. It was the stuff that was kind of like, um, I, I'm going to use a car analogy and it's kind of crude, but it's like buying a three series BMW. It's a great car. But in five years, that car's going to be worth less than you bought it for today. There's yeah. nothing special about it. Mm -hmm. They make too many of them. There's too much replicable product. And we've had that phenomenon in Sunny Isles before. We saw it with you know a number of buildings. Interestingly, now the new breed, the new product, is all coming in over $2,000 a square foot. And, and the luxury product on the beach yeah. is 3000 The director of sales at St. Regis, I was out with him last week. We were at an event. Um, and he told me, I just sold a unit for $6,000 a square foot at wow. St. Regis in Sunny Isles. And I'm like, never seen that before. And I know we've got, you know, the, the Aquilina um, estates just opened. Yeah. Um, uh, Ritz Carlton's been doing extremely well. The luxury, um, what I would call the hospitality brands, have done very, very well, which is obviously going to be great for the new St. Regis product. Um, but I don't see that market coming down. But I do think people have to be aware of the mid range product. Although Miami's doing really, really well, you've got to be careful of generic stuff. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it always gets kind of hammered because when people want liquidity, for whatever reason, when markets move, and let's say opportunities come in the stock market, your husband knows yeah. this very, very well, people holding cash are going to want to, to take advantage itself, yeah. of that. Um, but I think that, you know, so you're bullish on the Miami market. 
which is great. Yes. Right. Hey, right place, right time. You know, last day when I decided to to finish with the show, I'm like, okay, this is when I'm going to start branding myself, like add like girls to my team. And this is how I created my, my own little group, a well, very small group. But my goal was like, okay, like let me just focus on that and just really go full force with marketing and, and you know, branding myself and let people know that I'm here. Yeah. And I know, obviously, we are trying to do the same market, but I feel like there is always business for everybody. I don't believe we had uh-huh. this. So, there is always know, business for people. I, I, one of my, my first podcast I did with Ben Moss, who's a dear friend of mine, yeah. and he's a compass too. And I think that we've transitioned beyond our re- respective brokerage houses. Our brands stand on their own two feet. We have our own following, our own client base. And, mm. and of course, the brands, you know, the, the brokerages help. But we are the brands unto ourselves. And I think it's it's nice that we can have this dialogue. I think you have to share the information. 100%. I, I'm going to champion you to do really well in the Miami market. I'm sure you will. You're a lovely person. Thank you. I think you. it's <laughs> nice for people to see who you really are. I think that, you know, you've always come across really, really well. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot more deals with you than I know, when we than started in 17. Condo. We'll do a lot more. <laughs> I relisted it, by the way. I'm waiting for the buy. Oh, give me a call. Maybe I can bring a buy this time around. Yeah. Um, Maya, thank you for doing the show with us today. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. And Thank stay you for having me. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure. And uh, stay tuned for another episode of the David Siddons Podcast.